All righty. Well, go ahead and open up your Bibles to the uh, 10th chapter of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10, we'll be reading verses 9 through 11. We're going to talk about tonight the word living in us. Bill, we good with your... We are good. Yeah, he's happy. He's got, a, he's got a solution right now. I'm having to wear two microphones to make Bill happy, but it's working. Like I said, we've been, we've been having some issues, so if you've been watching my internet and noticing some, some static or whatever, we apologize. We've encountered some issues, and we're, t we're still troubleshooting them out. But we're doing a workaround for now. Hallelujah. All righty. Romans 10, 9, uh, uh, Romans 10 uh, 9 through 11. For this is the word of promise. At, I'm sorry. That if thou shalt confess, I was reading the ninth chapter, that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, we know. Um, Either we know or we should know, or you, it's time for you to find out and know, that faith is of the heart and not of the head. It is not a mental um, acceptance. It is not, um, as Kenyon used to refer to it, mental assent to the word of God. It is of the heart, the, the real man. Remember the heart. Now remember the Bible term heart in reference to man is not talking about your, the, the uh, cardiovascular system. It's not talking about the, the pump that pumps the blood through your body. It is in reference to the heart, the center, the core of man, which is his spirit. Man is a spirit. He has a soul. He lives in a body. And so faith is of the heart. Faith, faith is of the spirit. It is a spiritual force, not a mental force. Uh, the recognition of the lordship of Jesus is, is how we are saved or born again. And this is done with our spirits, not our heads. Um, lordship, now the word lordship means bread provider. The one who sustains, protects, and cares for us. He is our Lord. Everybody say, Jesus is my Lord. He is not my fire escape from hell. We don't confess him as our fire escape, do we? We confess him as Lord. We submit to his authority and lordship in our life. Amen. But in his lordship, he also is our bread provider, our sustainer, our protector, and our caregiver. Amen. So uh, he is a wonderful Lord. He, he is a gracious Lord. He is not an evil taskmaster. So when we submit to his lordship, we can trust that it will be in for our benefit and, our beha and good, uh, good for our beha on our behalf. Now, by virtue of his lordship in our lives, Jesus does become our caretaker. That's what we're going to talk about first here. He assumes that responsibility the minute we are born again. Notice how the, the, the father's attitude towards his children in Mark, Matthew 6, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? The answer to that is? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> are, they not, are they not much better than they? Are you not much better than they? Yeah. All right. Which of you, taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And the answer to that is not any. Ask Janie. She tried it. And, and why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, now here, see, Understand when the allegories are given or comparisons are given, God is trying to make a point to us. He said that the lilies of the field are arrayed even more with more splendor than Solomon had. And he goes, wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. And the, the statement here is this. If God so clothed the grass of the field, which is, you know, nothing. It's going to be burnt in the oven tomorrow. It's here today, gone tomorrow. And if God took the time, to clothe the grass of the field, something that will be gone tomorrow, okay? 
shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith. And that was not a compliment. It wasn't, hey, you got a little bit of faith there going on, dude. No, it was a rebuke for not trusting in the caregiver. Okay? Therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth. Everybody just underline in your Bible the word knoweth. That ye have need of all these things. Now let me say something. You'll never surprise God. <clears throat> Don't run to God in prayer when you get a bill you weren't expecting. Or it's bigger than you thought it was going to be. Or it was more than you thought it was going to be. Or you got less time to get it paid than you thought you were going to get it paid. Don't ever run to God now like he didn't know about it. Come on. Now, he already knew. He knew before he got there. Amen. He knows what you have need of. Okay? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now see, God's our caregiver. We get so caught up, now, I'm, I'm, and I want to say this without sounding like I'm, I'm undoing, you know, teaching from the past, you know, and using our faith. And so, but I, sometimes I think we get so caught up with believing God for everything, clothes, food, this, that, blah, blah, blah. always got our faith out there that we forget to seek ye first the kingdom of God. He said, if we would seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, those things would be added unto us. That was like everybody just sucked the wind out of the room. Yeah, but I got a four-part series. I got a 12-part series. I got a 32-tape series on, you know, how to believe God to get food, you know. And it's not wrong to use your faith, to put, but, you know, seek ye first. And I believe, you know, so many people, a lot of people came into what we call the Word of Faith movement, the teaching revival, because they had a lot of needs. They heard those answers to their needs. And they came in looking simply to get their need met. And they missed the very spiritual principle of seek ye first the kingdom of God. They missed the key to the whole ingredient. Now, how many of you have ever made something and forgot a key ingredient and it didn't taste right? All right, now Karen is, is uh, famous for her banana bread. Okay? But if Karen puts a whole the thing of banana bread together and puts it in the oven and takes it out and realizes that the bananas are still on the counter, you got a serious problem. You have not really banana bread. And you really don't have regular bread because, you know, it's got the bananas do some of the moisturizing and flavoring. I mean, you got something, some nuts in there and wheat. Okay? Well, what, what's wrong? You missed the key ingredient. Yeah. And even what you got left over, is it going to be really, everybody's going to go, well, that ain't, that, that ain't worth eating. You know? Might be too salty because the sweetness of the bananas all set, all, usually all sets the salt. Okay? Well, what's, what's wrong? You missed the key ingredient. We got a lot of people who came in and went straight to getting their need met and never seeking first the kingdom. And they're wondering why it don't taste quite right. They're wondering why it's not quite what it should be. I mean, the texture, you know, whatever. I mean, it kind of looks like it, you know. Uh, it doesn't smell quite like because you didn't have It's just something's wrong. You missed seek ye first. Now, he didn't say seek ye, you know, but I say seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said seek it first. Now, I don't believe God puts things in the Bible. Um, I'm sorry, my, my little clippy thingy came undone in my... Um, headset keeps getting pulled around. It's aggravating. So, the beauty of television. Hallelujah. Hallelujah is right. He said the Gentiles seek after all those things. Now, what's that mean? They're, they're, when they're, that's a thesis. That's a thesis statement, basically. The Gentiles seek after all these things. 
What's the antithesis? The church shouldn't. The church should be seeking the advancement of the kingdom. Now, I preached along this line a number of years ago, and, and people didn't really like it, didn't really receive it, because they were running off to, you know, you're going to have a million dollars next week. I would have loved for everybody in the church to have gotten a million dollars next week. That would have been awesome. The town on that would have built buildings all over the place. We could have, we could have just bought a jet and flown all over the world. I mean, everybody get a million dollars. And listen, it's not wrong. You know, you've got to have a balance of prosperity. We talked about that. Um, it be a biblical balance, not a compromise, not, you know, living and barely get along and, you know, down in Grumble Alley and not having enough and, you know, not know sure if you're going to get to eat tomorrow. That, that's the extreme in the other direction. But then the other extreme is it's all about me. It's not all about you. It's about the things of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. So, why? Because our caretaker... Ever say, my caretaker is Jesus. Say, the my caretaker is Jesus. He's going to, what? On behalf of the Father, at least, he's going to make sure you have all those things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be, what things? What you shall wear, what you shall eat. Isn't that right? What shall we eat, what shall we drink, and what shall we wear? He said all those things will be taken care of. If you're doing what? Seeking the advancement of the kingdom. Now, one of the problems I've seen in, in, in mis, either misteaching or misreceiving of the message of prosperity is suddenly people get very consumed about them and what they can have. And when it comes time to bless the kingdom, they're blessing themselves. Did anybody check for guns and knives at the door tonight? That's one of those things that get you hurt in church, especially in a, in a, a word of faith church. Hello? We, get, we start getting caught up with ourselves. God wants me to have this and God wants me to have that. Yeah, but, you know, God wants us to do this for the kingdom. Well, I'm sorry, Pastor. My money's all tied up in, in what, I, what God told me I could have. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Now, we've got to strike the balance here of not getting over where you can't have everything, it's all for the kingdom, and, you can, and, and then not, well, I don't, can't give anything to the kingdom because I'm taking care of all the stuff I can have. You know, usually if you'll find in Scripture, Scripture does balance itself, and it usually starts with the heart attitude. Where is your heart? And that's why he said, seek first. He didn't say seek only. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. You see, there's the balance in that. It's not that it's only, you can't do anything because everything has to go to the kingdom. You know? Send your kids out trick-or-treating and fill up bags of candy so you can get the four children somewhere uh, that don't have any and your kids don't get it, keep any of the candy. Well, that's crazy. You know, they're, they're, they want candy too. Hello? You know, you're going to make them hate the things of God. Every time I went and got candy, I had to give it away to somebody else. I couldn't even eat. You know, we got four bagfuls, and I couldn't even keep any. Well, that's not what God wanted. Shouldn't be trick-or-treating in the first place. Anyway, <laughs> we were trunk-or-treating. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. So he's our caretaker, and we're in his kingdom. Colossians 1.13 says, Who has delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, and we've been made righteous. He's made him sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And so, um, I'm sorry, I, I kind of jumped over there a little bit. If we're in his kingdom, and we're to be seek, so we're, we're to be seeking the advancement of the kingdom. That means witnessing to people, sharing with people. Um, our lives are to be used for the glory of God. Now, when Dad, now when, when Dad had the meeting uh, on prosperity and called in all the prosperity preachers, then he released his book a year later, the, uh, the Midas Touch. Y'all do know the book was printed the year he had the meeting. He just held off for a year because of the conflict that was caused by that, the meeting right before camp meeting. 
he didn't want to cost you. I, I, you, you, you think of Dad Hagen and you think of the, the love he walked in and, and his, his concern for the body of Christ. He didn't have that meaning because he wanted to prove everybody wrong. He wanted to, he wanted to keep. He said, I'm determined. What he said, uh, one of the things he said was, well, you're not preaching anything new. And what, what you're teaching was taught back in the 50s and it killed the move of God. And, I, and I'm determined not to let that happen again. He, he, he gave his heart. What you're teaching in excess killed a move of God. And if we don't arrest it and stop it now, it's going to do the same thing. And guess what? They didn't listen, and it did. Right. Have you noticed how we're kind of been kind of in a, a funk the past few years? Because everybody just kept right on pushing and kept right on pushing and kept right on pushing. Even after Dad went home and even after the book was released, they kept right on pushing. And, you know, and then people woke up one day and found out they've given thousands of dollars to preachers and they don't have, they're not anywhere down the road. They're still, they're still struggling paycheck to paycheck. Hello? But a lot of those guys running around in, in, in multi-million dollar houses and stuff and, and got $20,000 guard dogs and, you know, and all this stuff. And uh, you, the people didn't because they gave up and they did everything they were told. No, you're supposed to seek the kingdom. It's just, uh, I said this, I, I mean, God Dunning had a post on that. I had to post on it because it was good. So, you know, it's just as scriptural to not muzzle the oxen. That yeah, is scriptural. But, you know, it's just as scriptural to give to the poor, to take care of the needy. And one of the things I said, said in my, my response back to his Facebook post was, you know, how often have we seen the poor people sit down in the church and we shove all the money in their pockets and they walk out with $25,000? And said, said a preacher said, said one thing. He was at a meeting. He sat on the end of the road, got $25,000, and he didn't even preach that week. Well, that's great. Did the guy from Walmart who, who watched floor at night get anything? I believe when we become sensitive to the building of the kingdom, we become sensitive to the heart of God. And we act like God. We're to be imitators of him as dear children. And so we seek to treat humanity and people the same way that the Father treats them. Everybody say, Shonda. It's true. And see, you know, and see if, you, if you're not careful, you get on the other side of the thing. And preachers ain't nothing but money grubbing dogs. They shouldn't have anything. Lord, you keep them humble and we'll keep them poor. See, a lot of the, the excess and preachers uh, being blessed or teaching on that and getting blessed or whatever. It, it came out of the, Lord, you keep them humble, we'll keep them poor mindset, which is in the other ditch. Where the preacher wasn't supposed to have anything, you know. I mean, he's got, he, he's got the parsonage, and he's got, a, he's got a 1922, you know, Model T that still runs. He's good. Well, that's, that's crazy the other way. But he doesn't have to have a million-dollar Lamborghini either. That's one thing if you go out and make investments and earn it. So, you know, you don't need to rate the church to get a million dollar Lamborghini. Why don't you take the, uh, a $60,000 car and get 940 to build churches? Amen. Just asking. So, we're to seek, be seekers of the kingdom. We're to advance the kingdom. We're to be reaching to the hurting. We're to be reaching out to people. Amen? Hallelujah. We are in that kingdom. We have his righteousness, but we're to seek to advance it. Not just have it, but to advance it. Can I say something? I know I say these things a lot, but can't. I'm going to say, do I have your permission to say it? All right, thank you. I was going to say it anyway, but it would be nice when I have your permission. It is not all about you. Jesus came to reconcile us to the Father so we can walk out the Father's plan. It's not just so you can feel good about yourself. I was talking about, uh, we were talking tonight as, as a family, just talking about people we know. They're like the, 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 the bow of a ship, or whatever you call that part of the ship that's in the water at the front. Anybody, is it the bow or whatever it is? Plowing through the water. Shooting to get to where they feel good about themselves. And behind them is a wake of destruction. Hello? Now, they feel great about, they, they, they come to a place, they feel great about themselves, and when you look behind them, it's just, I mean, they went through, it's like they went through a harbor with an with a ocean liner at full steam and just washed craft up off of the dock and turned them over and all that kind of stuff. 
It's not all about you. God came to reconcile you and bring you into the body, and now the body of Christ is becomes a, you become part of the supply side economics of the kingdom of heaven. The body is compacted by that which every joint supplies. I'm not talking about finances right now. I'm talking about spiritual supply. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. If people, oh Lord, help me not get off task here. If people would do the Bible, they wouldn't keep having all the issues they have and all the having to seek out and feel better about themselves that they have. If we would just do the Bible, you know, Jesus said this. Remember what Jesus said? Well, I do. What, what Brother Hagin used to get? He used to get mad about that woman who, who left her husband because she had to find herself. She got on Christian television and told everybody she left her husband because she had to find herself. Some things he didn't like, he didn't put up with. You know what? When I got born again, I found myself. And that's what you need to find. But I need, but I need you, you stop looking. Stop looking for human acceptance. And stop looking for your self-esteem coming from who you can rub shoulders with and who you can buy your influence with. Start finding your self-esteem in the way Jesus did when he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. Remember, the disciples went away to get something. He's sitting there with the woman, the Syrophoenician woman, and said, she came to get water. He said, give me a drink. Amen. And she says, why are you talking to me? She said, you know, the Jews have no dealings with us. He said, well, go and find your husband and, and, and bring him, and I'll tell you all the truth. You know, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. She said, sir, I have no husband. He says, yeah, you've said that right. You've had five, and when you're shacking up, well, it ain't your husband. Now, see, today we would say that's condemning somebody. Wouldn't we? The church, they would say, you can't say that. That's condemning. No. If you love people, if you really love people, you want them liberated from the bondages that are keeping them out of God's blessings. It's the world that says that pointing out what people, what, that, that this is wrong. Listen, it's not, if, it's how you do it now. If you do it in a condemning, you dog, sinner, you, you're going to hell, <laughs> and I'm going to help you. Well, that's not, that's not what we were after. But to say, hey, doing that's wrong. Now, God forgives you. God loves you. But it's still sin. You said, you well said. And, um, you know, and so he ministered to her. The disciples show up. And he's not hungry. Did somebody feed him? He said, that's when he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. His satisfaction in life came from obedience to the will of God and his role in the plan of God, fulfilling that destiny. Not in whether or not you got the lead position on the reach out team or not. Or whether you're you can hang with the pastor eight days a week and be his fishing buddy or not. Well, you, you're in trouble there anyway. I don't fish. Even when me and Nathan go out, I watch him. I don't fish. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of a fishing license. It's a waste of bait. It's a waste of everything. Because I, I don't have the patience of Job. I got the patience of a squirrel. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, squirrel run up to the edge of the road. He can't cross it immediately. He, he just can't take it. He's back up a tree somewhere. Hallelujah. You know, coming in, you got to be the lead dog here and the big dog there, and you got to be in charge of this. You know, so you can find your Christian acceptance. It's not about you, it is about the kingdom. It's not about if you get credit or not. 
It's not about if you get your name and lights or not. There's going to be a lot of preachers who get to heaven and thought they were something else, and the reward, they think, they, they're going to see Jesus coming with the reward, and they think, oh, look at that big reward I'm getting for what I did, and they're going to right past you and give it to that little old prayer warrior who nobody ever heard of, who prayed and prayed and prayed for your ministry for years, sometimes not even knowing who they were praying for, just praying in the Holy Ghost because they were advancing the kingdom. See, it's about the kingdom. God has saved you. He has delivered you. I think we need to get more like Paul in a lot of our thinking. See, on one minute, Paul tells us who we are positionally, what we have in Christ, who we are in Christ. But don't let that go to your head. And get, go get the big head. Look, um, look at all the children of the, these multi-millionaires who made it in life because they have, have a good work ethic. They worked hard. Then they grow up, they get multi-millions of dollars, they die, the kids get it, and they, they, they don't know what to do with it because they didn't earn it. They didn't, they didn't ever learn. They got the big head about what their daddy gave them. They had no appreciation for it. Kind of need to go back and watch McClintock. Have you ever seen McClintock? John Wayne movie? Y'all have never seen McClintock? I'm going to cast that out of y'all. Go get McClintock and look at it. Has that long speech with his daughter about how that she's a handsome filly and, you know, all the, the young guys that are going to be after her because they think he, they're going to get all of what he has, but they're not. He's going to give her a 500 cow spread up on the up Mesa Verde or whatever, you know, because you know, all that growing together and all that has this long spill about growing and stuff, you know. Let, don't let what, your rights and privileges in Christ and what belongs to you in Christ go to your head. Because Paul still called himself the bondservant of the Lord. After all the revelation, after all he had, all that God had showed him, he still considered himself his servant in one vein. Oh, that's a negative confession. My goodness, Paul didn't know that. Bless his heart. Think of what he could have done for the kingdom if he hadn't had that, had, had got the revelation he wasn't a servant. No, you know that revelation of his servanthood did? It kept him humble. It kept him from getting a big head. It kept him focused on the mission at hand, what he was there to do. The teaching on prosperity, the teaching on our rights and privileges in Christ, the teaching on the authority of the believer are not so you can run around and just get stuff and be you know, a, hot, a hot shot of prosperity. It is so you can advance the kingdom of God. I said it so the kingdom of God can be advanced. It's going to take your help. Those of you watching, you know, don't get mad at me. But it's going to take your help. There are things that, that our church is supposed to do. It's going to take money to do it. We have, we, I know right now we've got men and women of God who are, who are sidetracked because of things in their life that are called to go do stuff. It's going to take money for them to go do it. Sometimes it's, the fact they're not doing it is just it was a money issue. They're not out doing the, the, what God has for them because there's not the money there. There's things we're supposed to be doing. We need money to do it. So the prosperity, here's, here's where we get in trouble. When we start hoarding it all up for ourselves and not realizing that God's prospering for a greater reason. Now, I've heard people, oh, I've heard that teacher don't go live on the 10 and give the 90. And uh, I've heard people talk about that, and I've been around people like that, and I'll be honest with you, I never see them give the 90. They're always talking about it, but they're never doing it. Well, shut up. I don't mean that ugly. Stop talking about it unless you're doing it or working towards it. Instead of every time you get a little bit of extra money, you go buy something else that costs $80,000 or something. And that, could, that could have been used for the kingdom. And I'm not... Again, I'm not trying to come off of prosperity and get too far the other way, but we've got to have an adjustment in our mindsets. How many have had an adjustment in your mindset in the past three or four years on the economy? You don't need to drive the, the, the two-mile-per-gallon SUV to the grocery store that's 30 miles away because it's got cool lights in there. You know? One of these fancy places. 
You know, the little old food line thing right around the corner will work just fine. Because, you know, because it will cost you $40 in gas just to go to the other one. Because you had the cool lights. It was upper crusty. You know, had that feel. Who cares what you feel like while you're buying it? If you, when you come home and cook it, if it tastes right. All right. So seeking first the kingdom of God. Now, I'm establishing that as, as, as a baseline premise to where we go from here. So when we start talking about uh, new creation realities or different things, we understand that we've, we've started from the position that we're seeking first the kingdom of God. First, not only first. Y'all understand that. You, you get that, don't you? I'm not saying God doesn't want you to have a nice car. Come on. Y'all here to go home? But please don't go out and get a $800 a month lease on a vehicle so you can look like you're prosperous so you can make all your friends think, you know, I'm prospering. A lot, a lot, how many remember back in the day of the satellite seminars? They had the power tie. And whatever the guy wore was the power tie. But they had to go out and buy the power tie. Like that tie had some intrinsic Holy Ghost value that was going to make you prosperous or walk with God or get something done for the kingdom. Brother Copa said he was sitting on the platform one day and this woman walked by and went, oh, and hit her husband and said, that's what you need. You need some socks like that. Kind of socks Brother Copeland had on. Well, I'll be honest with you, I've never found a pair of socks yet that had the, that that were made you any more anointed or less anointed than any other pair of socks. Can you? And you people get oh, he's got on power socks. No, I, but I can tell you they're probably smelly by the end of the night. Do your socks always smell good? <laughs> no, okay. Anybody ever been an athlete and been in the locker room? Oh, yeah. And then, you know, have football practice on Friday and take off your, your wet, sweaty T-shirt and throw it in the locker and forget to take it home and wash it. Come back in on Monday, it's turned to ammonia. That's why when you walk in the locker room, they always stunk. And then some guys that put it back on. I'm sorry, I'll just go without one. I ain't wearing that nasty thing. Matter of fact, why you see how it, will, it, will it catch on fire? All right. So now, from the position that we're seeking first the kingdom of God, now we enter into the revelation of who we are in Christ. But who we are in Christ establishes our relationship and our walk with the Lord as one of family and not as outcast. Even though we have a servant's mindset in, in serving the kingdom and doing with our rights and privileges what we could do with them, we are still able to approach our Father in a, in, in, the, in a relationship basis. He's our Father, we're His children. Um, Romans 8, 14 6 through 16, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, wherever we cry, Abba, or some translations say Daddy, Father, the Spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 1 John 3, 1, Behold what man of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Now, we are in the family of God. And I just got, long, got done with a 25-minute, you know, uh, it's not a rant, but a you know 25-minute presentation on seeking first the kingdom, having a servant's heart, maybe a servant's attitude, now, not in the sense of lowly and unworthy, but in, 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 in your service, what you do with what you have. Remember Jesus. Now, how many know that Jesus knew who he was? Anybody believe that Jesus knew who he was? Three of you. How many not believe that Jesus knew who he was? Yet, he went to the disciples one day with a towel and water and began to wash their feet. And he said this in that process. 
that the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister. His mindset, he knew who he was. But he was going to take his position and use it with a servant's mindset of serving others. And when he came to Peter, Peter said, not so, Lord. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And he said, not my feet, my hand. I mean, you know, just, I mean, okay, go ahead. My head, my hands. Jesus was demonstrating that who we are, what we have, is to be used to minister to others. Not so we can just collect a lot of stuff. Now he said, if you would seek the kingdom and his righteousness, he'd take care of the stuff. Well, that went over big. Say, glory. No, listen. Now, we love this. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, then we don't like that part, then we may also be glorified together with him. Yeah. Our, our word of faith circles run from that word. You've know, you got you to interpret the word suffering in the right context. We suffer what he suffered. We suffer persecution. They that live godly will suffer persecution. Amen. Now, if you're suffering persecution because you're preaching live right and you out running around, that's not persecution. That should come up and you gotta be I guess older or country folk to understand come up and means you're getting your just dues. All right? But notice, now, wait a second. If we're heirs, we jump on that, woo, praise God, I'm reigning in life. I'm, a, I'm in heaven. I'm, I'm, I'm above everything. Yeah, but, he's, but Jesus is the one, he said, if we're heirs, we're joining heirs with Christ, and he washed feet. That was me. Wow. Now, I grew up Pentecostal. Now, I don't know other churches do it, but I know Pentecostal churches do it. They even, have, they even have it in their, uh, my particular denomination's manual, they have the ordinance of foot washing. And they'd have services where they all got together, got out the wash pans, and went around, they washed each other's feet. Now I know some people here, they, the pastor don't ever do that here now. Wait a second now. See, some folks ain't even thinking about being close to being willing to do it. Jesus did it. Now you understand in their day, it was very, it, when people came into the, 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 the washing of the feet, they, they walked by foot, wore sandals, feet were dusty. They come into the home and somebody would wash their feet. Usually a servant would wash their feet, you know, to cleanse them and, you know, so they could come in. They wouldn't have dirty feet all over the house. They wouldn't have to look down there and you got dusty, nasty feet sitting around. And Jesus was doing that. And see, Peter didn't have the right revelation. He thought because when you were, when you were the, the most elevated, you didn't do things like that. But Jesus said, I came to do this. He came to set the example, to serve one another. Didn't the Bible say, by love, serve you one another? Yes. There's not enough teaching on serving. Why? It's not popular. To be honest, the American, church in America has got to wake up. We've got to preach the unpopular as long as it's truth. Now, don't preach unpopular if it's not truth. But just don't preach what everybody wants to hear because it's popular. John 16, 27 says, The Father himself loveth you. Because you've loved me and have believed that I came out of God. See, God takes his position of care for us and to love us. By coming into the family of God. You know, and Jesus said, because you love me and I came out from the Father, he will love you. Amen? Hallelujah. We, and we're to take our place as sons. Now, you know, see here, Pastor, you're double talking. No. 
I've already showed you Jesus was a son who served. Paul knew who he was. Why do we call it the Pauline revelation? Is that not what's referred to often? Who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, what we can do in Christ is often referred to as the Pauline revelation. And most scholars believe he got that revelation when he was stoned, left for dead, and caught up to a third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, he could not tell. But her things unlawful to be uttered. I believe he saw the new creation. I believe he saw and had a revelation of what it meant to be in Christ, caught up into the third heaven. I believe he came back to the earth and came back into his body. He didn't know how to say it. And over the next 30 or 40 years, through something called the epistles, as the Holy Ghost revealed what he saw, he wrote it out. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new, and all things are of God. For he who knew no sin was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He saw that. But it took the working of the Holy Spirit for him to be able to write that out in epistles, letters to the church, doctrine to the church. He knew who he was in Christ. He'd seen the new creation man. He, had see, he was called up into the third heaven, saw those things, digested them, and over time wrote them out to the church. We refer to it as the Pauline Revelation. And yet he says he was a servant, a bondservant of the Lord. Amen. And I believe we can come back to the place. Can I say something? I love good worship, but worship, just coming and worshiping is not all what the church is about. That's great. It's great to worship. It's great to have really good worship. It's great to get into the presence of God. But when we leave that place, our existence was not about coming and worshiping. It's to go do. With what we got while in his presence, go and do for people and serve humanity and serve the Father and taking, because the Father's heart. What does the Bible say about the Father? He's not willing that any should perish. Now his will is none should perish. That'll mess up your election doctrine. God God's will is that some get saved and some don't. God chose some get saved and some don't. How can he not be willing that any should perish and that be true? Now man makes the choice. I said man makes the choice. We need to go do, see that time of worship, we do, and I'll be honest with you, corporate worship is great, but you need to be a worshiper of God in private. If we're not careful, we'll get so dependent on the cool music and all the other stuff, we won't be able to be worshipers. We'll be participators in entertainment. That went ever even bigger. Can I get an amen from the back row? <laughs> or, or a halfway nod or something. Is Ron back there? Okay. We need to be individual worshipers, private worshipers. So that we come together corporately, it is worship. But listen, life is not just about coming to church on a Sunday. And, you know, and, and, and there's places now, it's all about the worship, and they don't even really care if you get the word or not. Faith doesn't come, in by, doesn't come by worship. Faith comes by hearing the word. We're to, work, we're to worship him in spirit and in truth, but it is not about, that's not what life is all about. We've we turned it into that. Come to my church, it's cool. We got rock and worship. Okay. What do you do when you go back out? Are you a minister of reconciliation? Are you sharing the truth of the gospel with humanity? Are you taking Jesus to people who are hurting? Are you a servant to the Lord? Yes, you're a son, but you're also a servant. Are you serving him and carrying forth the message he has for you to carry forth? He's made us ministers of reconciliation. Are you sharing the truth with people? Are you helping people? Are you bringing them in out of the, out of the highways and the byways into the kingdom of God? 
Because I'm going to tell you something, that's your father's heart. People close their eyes and go into eternity without knowing Jesus. Christians didn't take the opportunity to minister to them. Christians stood by and wouldn't share the truth with them. Christians didn't serve because they're using their faith to get a new car. Now, I'm talking attitude here. I'm not talking don't have something new. I'm talking about our heart attitude. God, sometimes I feel like you sh I shouldn't have to go back over and say, no, no, we're not saying you can't have stuff. But people, people, take, see, people take you wrong. People, you say something, people take it, they'll run off the deep end with it. Dad Hagen, you had a little bitty book called You Can Have What You Say. Now, if you listen to his teachings and everything, it was all, you know, there was, there was balance to it. You just couldn't have anything you wanted. You couldn't have somebody else's wife and whatever else. You know, it was, you can have what you say, the Bible promises you. The people, people run around going, I believe, and they confess to somebody else's wife. Confess to somebody else's car. See, they'll take stuff you say, and if you don't just overly explain it, they'll run off the deep end with it. Take a message on righteousness and run off the deep end with it. I'm, I can't lose my righteousness, so I'm going to go out and just do whatever I want to do, and I'm still righteous. You know? Got grace. I can fornicate and live with somebody, and I'm, it's all right with God because I'm under grace. I'm already cleansed from it before I do it. Some stuff people say you just kind of just shake your head. And you can't, it's almost, you, can't, you, you have a hard time saying, help them, Jesus. You think, Holy Ghost hit them with a two by four. I'm joking. No, we take our place as sons with a servant's heart. With a servant's heart, we can take our place as sons. We want to help, we want to help advance the kingdom. Okay? John 14, 23, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Worship them in spirit and in truth. I believe that our lifestyles are also a part of worship. How we live. How we honor the Father with our life. I think it rings hollow in the ears of the Father for you to come here on Sunday and sing how great is our God and go out on Monday and live like you don't know God. I was worshiping. Yeah. But the heart of the worshiper must be in line with his worship. Don't y'all like it when I preach on what you can, you can have, what you say? Better than this. But see, if we'll do this, we'll have what we say. The Father will take, our caretaker will watch over us. Amen. We have his ability. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. See, these are all great scriptures. These are all things that we, we believe we, had, we hold as dear. And if we'll change an attitude just a little bit, then the, then the effectiveness of him having his ability, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He meets our needs. We don't have to worry, fear, or doubt. Our Father is our provider and our sustainer. Um, we're to be doers of the word. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves, James 1.22. Psalm 3, 5, and 6. Three, psalm, psalm, psalm. psalm chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. See, we hold those dear. We hold what God does for us and how God cares for us as dear. And he's going to bless us and bless us and bless us. How much more fulfilling things will be when we learn to honor him, to have the heart of a servant. You don't have to act like a servant. You don't have to go out and live in the shanty. You don't have to have nothing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about acting like a servant. I'm saying have the heart of a servant. There's a difference between 
living like a servant in the sense of you don't have anything and you, you know you can't ever get anything and having the heart of the servant of using what you have at hand to carry out what is the heart of the father the will of the father that is to reach humanity to reach the lost to go to the hurting to go to the imprisoned to go to the bound and even though you're in a position of being one with, the, one with the Father through Jesus Christ, and you're seated at the right hand of the Father in Him, and you've got your rights and privileges in Christ, glory to God, and He's going to bless you because you gave in the offering. You take all that you have and all you possess, and you go use it to minister life to the hurting. You strip yourself. Remember, Jesus stripped himself of his rights to deity and to glory. What for? To carry out the will of the Father. This is a big change in our thinking. Now, I want to make sure we don't go off the deep end the other way. You know, well, we're just going to have to be humble and we ain't going to have nothing. No. Don't release your embrace or the truths we have. But let's go back in front of them and go back to the very thing, seek ye first, the kingdom of God, and put that as the parameter on which all those other things are built and operate from what I have in Christ. But what I have in Christ is subordinate to me seeking first the kingdom. Now first, and we, I'll say it as it closes, like, First, not only. He didn't say only seek the kingdom. He said seek it first. Put it in first priority. Learn how to use your authority as a believer to advance the kingdom. Learn how to use your faith to win souls. Learn how to use the prosperity to help missionaries, to help your local church. Amen. Learn to use all that we've learned with the first, with the, with the corrected parameter. Seek ye first. Can somebody say amen? amen. 